CEO of the Atlantic Council. Um, and welcome to uh, a significant event of the sort that may be unprecedented at the Atlantic Council. And my friend Jerry Seib from the Wall Street Journal knows that we're taught in all our years at, Atlantic, uh, at the Wall Street Journal never to use words like unprecedented, <laughs> because of course nothing's truly unprecedented. Um, but, uh, uh, but it could be the case with the rollout of, of John Raitt's excellent strategy paper for our Brent Scowcroft Center, Wither America, a Strategy for Repairing America's Political Culture. I say it might be unprecedented because throughout our 55-year-old history, we have focused on analyzing, understanding, and confronting threats that come primarily from outside our borders. The motto for today's event might be more, uh, we have met the enemy and he is us, to paraphrase either a, an 1812 uh, Commodore or Pogo, the cartoon character. Um, uh, as Ellen Tauscher, former Congresswoman, senior State Department official, and Scowcroft Center Vice Chair, writes in her excellent foreword, the political system that once created a strong, prosperous, and united nation, uh, united nation now sows, sh sows division. Uh, the question we should all reflect on in this session is whether our broken political system has become a national security issue. And I think that was the reason that I was so intrigued when I spoke with JR and he suggested uh, doing this sort of paper, and as I discussed it with Barry Pavel. Um, is it a national security issue, both in how it influences who we are, but also how we can attract and operate around the world? What JR has pulled off in the pages of his excellent, nuanced, and thoughtful report is both significant and timely. This is not really about the Trump presidency, though it's all about that as well. It's not about the administrations that preceded Trump, both Democrat and Republican, but it's also about them. It's not even about the poisonous partisanship that often undermines our ability to get things done, though it is also about that. As the executive, executive summary states, blaming partisanship is too imprecise and distracting. Uh, the Atlantic Council was there at the creation of the post-World War II global system that has brought us 70 years of relative peace and prosperity. Fast forward nearly 60 years, and American leadership is being called upon again to shape the future alongside our allies and friends. But part of our power on the world stage was our power of attraction and the power of the attraction of our democratic system. Part of our attraction was also our ability to confront tough challenges and in the end, always reach consensus. The domestic barriers to America's global leadership are significant as you'll hear today and in the report. But this report also prescribes a reasonable way forward. The coming years will test whether the United States can continue to be not only a world power, but also remain a world champion at self-correction. Uh, J.R. writes, in an era when national cohesion and exceptional leadership are essential, the U.S. political system seems designed to widen and exploit divisions rather than reconcile them. He adds, the national interest requires that Americans summon the nation's profound powers and courage once again to override a status quo that poses a clear and present danger to the country, indeed, to the very idea of democracy. The United States was born of this democratic seed, so the Atlantic Council's focus on this question isn't straying from our global purpose at all, but it is rather at the heart of it. This is the 13th in our series of strategy papers, uh, challenging us all to think beyond daily headlines to larger questions and strategies uh, to address them. So I salute Barry Pavel and his entire uh, Scowcroft Center team in this endeavor. Earlier this fall, a few, and this will get us off to our start, uh, earlier this fall, a few council staffers stepped out from behind their screens, grabbed a microphone and a camera, and stood their ground at film, filming locations across DC, the Supreme Court, Capitol Hill, and the White House. 
They met people from, acro uh, from across the country and, though a few, and through a few simple questions, ignited a dialogue on the state of America, her politics and her role at the inflection point of today's challenging world. So let's take a look at the film. I haven't seen it yet, so uh, I will be intrigued. <laughs> I think greed and selfishness. There is great luck um, for the most part on both sides. It seems pretty personal these days. The left and right are just completely being pulled apart and I don't necessarily think that's just America. I think it's kind of a global thing that's happening. I do feel like politics are very polarizing. Unfortunately, I feel like it's more often handshake agreements of I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine there or I'll contribute luck, funding um, to for the most part on both cause sides. because it my lobby or personal whatnot these has more the means right and more power in terms of completely being money and, and, and capital, not because of what's right or what's wrong, or truly what people kind of believe. Everything is kind happening. of inaccessible. I do feel like average. politics are very polarizing. Citizen, Unfortunately, you know, I feel like it's like more often handshake agreements of I'll scratch your back, I'll scratch mine, or I'll Some government officials don't seem very interested in doing their jobs. Maybe some of our elected officials have been in office a little too long, and not because of what's right or what's wrong. I feel like everyone's so wrapped up in, like, you need to be the top, but they forget about it's all about us, about the people. I think America's role in the world is to be a unifier, to support allies in need, and not to be good about it. I feel like it should be someone that helps, it doesn't create a war. But I do think we have a responsibility to use all of the resources that we have here to help people and to promote we have the resources, but I think we should be spending as much money on, you know, rebuilding our country, educating our children, as we do blowing up other countries. Nuclear weapons, you know, no more. We don't need that. We need food, we need health, and we need house. Freedom doesn't necessarily mean your career um, for the things that you believe in, but for everybody you know, to have the same freedom, our country, whether you're allies, educating uh, our children uh, as we do blowing up other countries. Whatever dream you want in this country without persecution or retaliation for anything. We're a whole country of all these different people with all these different backgrounds, but we are united as one. There's a monument down at the, I think it's at the Vietnam Memorial, and it says freedom is not free. And um, that's always resonated with me. So uh, we are here today in front of this capital um, on the shoulders of a lot of people that have gone before us and a lot of sacrifices. and. Um, so the freedom is that we get to come and talk to our representatives here and we get to have a vote, a vote and a voice and um, uh, there's just a million things that come along with that that I am grateful for. Uh, so that, that was really well done. Um, I'm happy to welcome to the stage the author of the report John Raitt is a 20-plus year veteran of public policy, working on such complex issues as national and homeland security, energy, the environment, and national resource management. He was a professional staff member on the 9-11 Commission and the Commission on National Guard and Reserves, and the Independent Commission on Security Forces of Iraq, and he, he's worked closely, still does, with General Jim Jones and, and before that, Senator John McCain. Uh, he's a non-resident senior fellow with the Brent Scowcroft Center on International Security and Atlantic Council, and he's a friend. I wouldn't have trusted this difficult subject with many people we wouldn't have and, and the Scowcroft Center, but you handled it very well, JR. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for that introduction, Fred, and, and also thank you for your outstanding leadership of this amazing institution. Uh, welcome to everybody, and, and thank you for taking time from very busy schedules to be here today. I'm deeply grateful to the Atlantic Council and for helping bring this report to fruition. 
a special shout out if I may to Matt Burroughs and Alexander DeCoco, Mike Rossi and Ellen Rena for their excellent work. Uh, the report released today confronts a set of questions that resound not only throughout the nation but across an anxious world. What's behind the United States fractured politics and deepening public dysfunction? What do these trends mean for the future? And how can we right the ship? In sum, wither America. Comforting though it may be to regard last year's grossly degrading presidential campaign and the chaotic state of American public life as anomalous and transient, doing so would be mistaken and dangerously distracting. Today's dramas are not the cause of trends unhinging American politics and governance. They are, I submit, a product of them. In fact, I started thinking about this report over six years ago, as year over year, the nation's political campaigns seemed to be growing more vacuous and demeaning, as the country's political culture was consistently proving itself better at widening the divisions than reconciling them, and as the political center in Washington was evaporating, and with it, compromise and consensus, concepts that had become dirty words when, in fact, they are the blood and sinew of functional democracy. Something was terribly off when policymakers in perpetual campaign mode were growing ever more distracted from their responsibilities, while future defining challenges have continued to pile up unaddressed. The report analyzes how the country has reaped the division and dysfunction long sown by the two major political parties. For so long, the country has seen Republicans make a sport of demonizing government in appealing to their favored constituencies, while Democrats have continuously bashed business to theirs, each blaming the other for all the nation's every ill. Lost in all the finger pointing is the fact that effective government and strong private enterprise are co-ingredients of national success. We have watched all consuming party intramurals grow wildly effective at firing up party bases while obscuring national interest. And the country has witnessed the parties build a political culture in Congress that carries public approval ratings only slightly better than food poisoning, yet enjoys record rates of incumbency. What the public does not see is coherent grand national strategy or the kind of bipartisan teamwork necessary for leading the country responsibly into the future. No one is disputing that partisan rancor and from time to time stalemate are as old as American politics and governance itself. Of course they are. But what's new and alarming is their crushing magnitude, how they are being systematized, and the monumental vulnerability they create for the country in these perilous times. We have arrived at a point in which political tribalism and intra-party fissures are metastasizing into Balkanism, while congressional inertia is ossifying into steady state paralysis, a new normal causing our friends and allies to contemplate the fearful prospect of an American exit from global leadership. I say fearful because they know, sometimes much clearer than we, the indispensable role that America plays in a hopeful world order. It should alarm the country that leaders in the developing world, repelled by the US political circus, are looking elsewhere for leadership, but it doesn't. We shrug it off and carry on with the partisan games. And let's be clear, the adversaries of freedom and democracy are watching carefully too. They gain strength and boldness from the prospect of America doing to itself what no hostile foreign power or ideology has been able to accomplish, spoil the American idea. That's why the challenges addressed in this report are far more than domestic policy concerns. As Fred pointed out, they constitute clear and building dangers to national security and indeed to global order. So what's behind all this and how do we deal with it? In answering the question, wither America, the report does three things. One, it breaks down the mechanics driving political balkanism and public sector dysfunction. Two, it spotlights how these dynamics are producing what I call a casualty of virtues, a ph phenomenon that poses the gravest threat to the long-term well-being of American democracy. And three, it offers a solution strategy. Readers will find in the report an illustration depicting the political dynamics as a set of gearworks. Its center, the flywheel, if you will, is what has become a mercenary campaign and election industry rigged for conflict and enriched by it at the country's expense. The central mechanism meshes with six interlocking gears that keep the powertrain of national political disorder and public disaffection grinding at full tilt. The first of them is the election industry's tactics, in effect, the business model of Campaigns Incorporated, which is simple. Exploiting fear and anger to produce, to produce division and distress 
which in turn expertly into attention, money, and votes. In this way, I believe the duopolistic parties are not just rivals, but codependents. The tactics mesh ne neatly with a power financial cog in the form of an all-consuming, pay-to-play campaign finance system, a system crying out for reform, and the uh, report addresses why and how. Corrosive tax tactics and money connect with a network of structural forces, including the center-destroying practice of gerrymandering, exclusionary primary rules, winner-take-all electoral, electoral votes, and a host of other campaign, balloting, and congressional practices that are pro-incumbent, anti-democratic, and counterfunctional. Congressional boundaries should be drawn not by partisan majorities for political ends, but by independent commissions based on good government criteria. We need to make all voters and votes count by opening primaries to independents and prorating electoral uh, college votes. And Congress must be modernized to focus on its duties rather than its rivalries. The report offers some ideas how. Sustaining a sensible center is harder thanks to a powerful media gear. Influential media outlets, as we know, have become little more than party organs, catering to partisan niches for ratings and revenue. We have seen the sacred line between news and commentary virtually obliterated. And in today's crowded media commons, partisans must yell louder and more provocatively to be heard at scale, obscuring more responsible and objective voices. All of these forces are accelerated by a fifth gear, modern technology, Despite all their good, the internet, big data analytics, and 24-7 connectivity enable the election industry to micro-target and pander to voters with greater precision and intensity. Social networking prepackages the public into cloistered communities of like-minded, making people and groups easier to target with tested buzzwords. It's clear we must harness technology to fight technology used to manipulate and deceive with digital efficiency, whether it's Russian bots, or partisan hackers. And finally are the social and cultural forces that reinforce many of the system's most destructive weaknesses. Consider the effects of a nagging society-wide short-termism and attention deficit. Politicians look to the next elections, business leaders to the next earnings report, and the media to the next scandal. If the public is pandered to, it's because we reward those who tell us what we want to hear and punish those who tell us what we need to hear. It's time that we, the people, look closer at our role in all of this. It's said that in democracy, people get the government they deserve. But what the public doesn't deserve and the nation doesn't need is a system geared not only to produce division and dysfunction, but worse, one methodically undermining the very virtues that define and dignify democracy, this casualty of virtues. We bear witness to the casualty of truth, overwhelmed by hyperbole and spin, most Americans hardly know who or what to believe anymore. A casualty of trust grows clearer every day between the parties, between red and blue America, and between the public and its institutions. The casualty of balance is wrought by biased news and partisan propaganda, slanted congressional districting, the sweepstakes approach to electoral votes, and by newly elected administrations and congressional majorities who presume popular mandates that exempt them from bipartisan collaboration. We are suffering the casualty of inclusion. Consider that only a scant portion of the country elects primary candidates or donates to political campaigns. Nearly 40% of the population doesn't vote. What is democracy if it's not inclusive? Daily, we feel the effects of the casualty of substance. In a complex world, yet political discourse subsists on simplistic eight-second sound bites and 140-character tweets. Our debates are often shameful scrums of uh, prefabricated slogans and ad hominem insults. National legislation is deemed meritorious because it's title that rather than its results. And ideas are no longer so much good or bad, but rather Republican or Democrat. They're merit measured by partisan advantage. Substance is further victimized by the demise of duty. Legislators have become fundraisers. Journalists operate like politicians. Judges function as legislators. Lobbyists as campaign financiers. Pollsters as strategists and leaders as bellwethers. And the casualty list includes the demise of discipline, dignity, and respect, all of which are addressed in the report. The net effect is stark and ominous. The country's widening internal divisions, deepening political dysfunction, and desertion of essential virtues poses a clearer and more present danger than any martial threat from abroad, even while it renders us more susceptible to them. 
The strategy set forth in the report can be described as the four C's of national political renewal. The first D, C, perhaps surprisingly, stands for competition, making the political parties, campaigns, and elections more competitive in the right ways over ideas and practical strategies centered on national interest rather than over money, name calling, and incumbency. In the last century, America busted business trust to serve the public better. It's time to break the party duopoly. We can do that by strong campaign finance reform, gerrymandering reform, election reform, such that everybody and every vote counts, and yes, making room for third parties. The second C is for cohesion. It's time to modernize Congress, make it more cohesive and functional. Twice since World War II, Congress overhauled the Department of Defense to make the military services more functional, effective in their missions. Time for Congress to turn that around and overhaul itself for the same purpose. The report suggests how. The third is content, empowering better self-governance by making truth, facts, and agendas more transparent to a more discerning public. We can do that by developing norms and trusted tools that authenticate bona fide reporting and call out political fakery and lies. Finally is the evolutionary power of civic engagement, the fourth C. The imperative of marshalling a powerful, irresistible civic movement to overcome a resilient status quo. Such a mission requires a major national reform and civics education campaign, one that should draw on the energies and lessons from the long and enduring struggle for civil rights. I think creditable political culture and good government are civil rights, demanding changes in public policy and ourselves to secure them. So we gather here at the Atlantic Council where the shelves bulge with world-class thinking and solutions to many challenges facing our country and the world. Political reform is their gateway. Without it, we can't hope to ensure the nation's prosperity and security what could be and should be an epic of unmatched human advancement with America in the lead. It's up to us to show the world that democracy can do more than simply survive the internet age of personal empowerment and decentralization we must demonstrate that it can be refreshed and strengthened by it. Let's have our differences, but let's be fair and factual. Let's have our fights, but let's be functional. And let's have tough and vigorous campaigns, but through a system with its virtues intact. We should take as our inspiration in the three Latin words enshrined in the great seal of the United States that capture so elegantly the beauty, power, indeed the necessity of democracy. The words e pluribus union of many, one. Fulfilling that ideal is our solemn duty. It requires refreshing and modernizing American democracy. We can and we must, with history as our guide and the future in our hearts, I know we will. Thank you. My name is Jerry Seib, Fred's former colleague and sometimes basketball competitor when our knees were younger. Um, um, JR, thank you for that. Congratulations. Um, it's a great report, um, somewhat depressing, but I think <laughs> appropriately so under the circumstances. Um, my job here is mostly to get the ball rolling out to these folks to get a conversation going and then uh, in a bit to draw you all in through your questions. Uh, your job is to have those questions, but also to uh, answer the, the questions that were posed of the people in the film we saw at the outset. So um, I remind you that you can and should do that, and we'll <coughs> see if we could reflect on what the thoughts of the people in this room are uh, along the way as well. Um, Ellen, I might start with you and just ask you if you have uh, what your general reaction is to what JR has laid out for us, um, points you would emphasize or, or disagree with. Thank you, Jerry. Um, <clears throat> well, as I say in the foreword, um, you know, I spent uh, seven terms in the Congress um, from 96 to 2009 when I left to become Under Secretary of State. And um, I beat a Republican incumbent mm. in uh, a swing district in California. Uh, and uh, over the arc of time that I was in the Congress, I saw 
many things that were deeply disturbing. The first form was uh, the lack of um, the ability for the center, where I was the center at one point, I was the leader of the 65 New Democrats. Um, they got washed away in 2010. Uh, when I came, it was the second term of Bill Clinton. Uh, we did a lot of things in a very bipartisan way, even though Newt Gingrich was the speaker at the time. We did uh, the balanced budget agreement. We passed tax legislation that got Democratic votes. We did a number of, of I think, very good things. <clears throat> um, as we moved into the post-9-11 time, um, what I noticed is that we were less and less likely to get out before December 22nd. Yeah. As most of you know, uh, the Congress uh, has a December 30th fiscal year end. We're meant to pass a budget, and we're meant to pass all the appropriation bills by then. Otherwise, we go into um, what's called the continuing resolution. And that effectively keeps the government at last year's numbers. Uh, and I started to believe, after a few years of doing it that way, that my colleagues in the Republican side who um, posed as fiscal conservatives and, and deficit hawks, effectively uh, found a way to, f to starve the beast. If you actually keep the government um, at a steady state of investment and don't change things or don't increase investments as uh, circumstances demand, um, you are somewhat starving the beast. And it was a way to... Um, to deal with what they believed was an out of control federal government. Um, I was subjected to gerrymandering. <clears throat> Even though I was a Democrat in California, my colleagues uh, in Sacramento didn't trust me because I was a centrist, but they also didn't trust me because I wasn't a politician. I had worked on Wall Street for 20 years, uh, then had been in the private sector, and hadn't been elected before I went to Congress. So I was unreliable because I wasn't necessarily somebody that cared about more about my party than I cared about anything else. And so they decided that if I should get hit by a bus or be taken out some other way, they didn't have a Democrat to take that seat. And so they tried in 2000 to redistrict my seat uh, to have more Democratic votes. Um, my district, thank God, rebelled and um, they had a tea party in Sacramento, and parts of my district were sewn back, and I ended up effectively keeping my seat. But I was in a swing district, a district that was a third, a third, a third, Republican, Democratic, and Independent. <clears throat> my father, who passed away last year, loved it when I would run for re-election, because every year I got more votes. And he said, this is the test of whether you're doing your job or not. Mm. Um, now I believe that. <clears throat> And they were right. I was unreliable. I did leave to become Undersecretary of State um, because I, I thought that I could actually add some value there. So I think, Jerry, what John has done here is not only written in, in a very um, authentic way, a report that uh, pulls back the Band-Aid on what I think all of us believe uh, are festering problems, but he provides solutions. I mean, we all can say, this is what's wrong, that's what's wrong, blame them, blame them. <clears throat> We've gotten too good at that. Um, but you know, whether it's the money, which of course it is, or the gerrymandering, which of course it is, or the tribalism, which of course it is, uh, the balkanization of um, the Congress uh, has led to the balkanization of the American people. And I think that, God forbid, we're in a situation where the President of the United States, whomever that is, turns to the Congress and says, I need you to give me a resolution tomorrow for something, including to go to war. I'm not sure that we could actually get the Congress to a place where they could actually have a debate and actually come to a consensus and move forward, because I think that they have become intrinsically too partisan and unable to think about it. So I'm honored to be part of of this uh, to write the foreword, but I, I commend this report to everyone that cares about their country, uh, cares about the world. Um, we cannot, as a house divided, do what we, meant, what we are meant to do for ourselves. And if we can't do what we are meant to do for ourselves, we lose the ability to influence the rest of the world. And that has been the secret sauce to the United States for 200 years. And so I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of this. I think. Uh, now the question is, who's going to take this on? Who's going to take this on and move it? Um, I wish that we would have 
one of the good old fashioned blue ribbon panels mm. um, of people that are disinterested in politics enough that they can actually do service to the country. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Peter, opening thoughts? First, John, that was a great presentation. Um, I'm going to take off, uh, take my comments off your last thing about from many one. I think the world we're sitting in here, the political world we're sitting in here is from many two. And so what we need to ask the question is, how did it happen in the last election where the aggregate negatives of both candidates uh, were 119%? And would that sort of thing continue into other elections? So I, I left, um, so what I want to do is just sort of give my little take on where we are today and maybe suggest that you have, you, you've written a paper that has, in one level is very comprehensive, another level is a little um, depressing because it's, it's a complexity of it. And so what I want to do is see if I can pick one or two things that might be extraordinarily um, uh, useful to create the change you're looking for. So if you look at this, here, what you see is you have Democrats at around 28, 29%, the Reds and the Republicans around 27, 28, and Independents, the difference around 43%. Uh, you have it the, the A's on both sides, the more extreme of both parties, and also the ones who are more, acti more activist, the moderates and less active, and then this tan thing in the middle. Now, if you speak to people in this town, they'll tell you, well, the, the Independents really don't exist. They're all closet. Democrats or Republicans at the end of the day. Well, I, I have pretty uh, substantial proof that they do exist. In 2012, I led an effort called American Select, which was to create a nonpartisan um, uh, nominating process that would yield, through the internet, a ticket that would be on the ballot in every state. And um, when we, and that uh, everyone could vote for through an internet-based caucus, not an internet-based um, confidential vote, but an internet-based caucus, not unlike what you would do if you would vote for Amazon. There would uh, be two uh, ac uh, accounting firms that would basically monitor and then re-verify re your vote, and get, it would be very, very accurate. And um, one of the things we did is we had to get on the ballot. So we went out into 41 states and stopped 4 million people and asked them a very simple question. Now, you have to understand when you go out and stop people, they don't want to be stopped. They're coming out of a Walmart with three bags of groceries and two kids. And so you don't have an elevator speech. You have one floor of an elevator speech. And we said something, we asked something very, very simple. Would you like to see somebody on the ballot, other than the Democrat or Republican, that you could have a hand in selecting? Now, if you look at this chart, you would say, well, the people least likely to say yes are the A's on both sides. They're the ones who are most resistant to change. And those who are most rece receptive are the B's, C's, and the B's. Now, the A's on both sides, let's say, constitute 15% each. So you would think if you went out at random and stopped 4 million people, about 70% less the friction cost would basically say, yes, I'll sign. Now, remember, when you're signing, it's not a casual affair. You have to sign. You have to give your, you have to give your address. And, and you have to be subject to reconfirmation by the state. So we stopped 4 million people. And guess what? 2.65 million signed. So that's just a scoonch below the 70% the you accepted. And the, um, and the second point of, uh, of data to say that these people re really do exist is we went through an exercise called Know Your True Colors, where you went out and you toggled for nine issue sets. And what the practices in this town, and uh, people like Gerald report on, is you basically report on the preference only, not the intensity first. So we asked people first, well, how intensely do you feel about this issue? And then give us your preference. When we did, I, I found people like my Dear wife, who thought she was for Barack Obama, suddenly discovered she liked John Huntsman more. And why is that? So let's say you and I have two issues. We want lower taxes, and we want better environmental regulation. If we agree that environmental regulation is more important, we'll vote Democratic. Taxes, we'll vote Republican. But if we agree on preference and disagree on intensity, we'll actually split our vote, even though we have exactly the same point of view. So the people here, if you really want to understand this, think of 30 issues. Think of them as um, having uh, registered between one and ten thousandth level of intensity and then their preference. And you realize the people here are all snowflakes. And all they have in common is they don't want to be the, the reds and they don't want to be the blues, but they don't want a third party that basically says, you must conform to this new platform. So what they really want is they really want the way to actually vote for candidates that are competitively viable that are not affiliated with either. So what is the problem? 
because to me that's the fundamental problem we sit with today. In the presidential era, what we know now, in the presidential arena, we know that you can vote for one of two coalitions, ABC or ABC. But if you're like my math son, you would ask the question, why can't I have the right to vote for a coalition who's the people I disagree with most in that coalition, I disagree with less than the people I disagree with most in any other coalition? And so that would be, why can't I have a BCB coalition? And the answer is, it is not permitted in this country for reasons you don't see. And for reasons I've been litigating against the Federal Election Commission for three years. So at the presidential level, it is debate access. As we have it today, the rules associated with debate access, if you backtest them, what you'll discover for, since 1960, guess how many Americans who did not go through the Democratic Republican primary system have basically hurdled the 15% requirement at the, taken in the middle of September to get into the debates. Does anybody have a sense of how many did that? Let's say there's 500 million Americans that have lived and died since 1960. Any guess? You'd be thinking of John Anderson, and John Anderson went through the Republican Party first to get name recognition. Right. And you'd also be thinking of Ross Perot, who when he entered the debates was at 9%. The answer is zero. 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 So how do you make a rule that basically, when you back test it, basically says the only people who've ever heard of that rule is a Democrat or Republican and call it nonpartisan. And if you look us up, we're in the middle of that, uh, that litigation right now. The Federal Election Commission filed their last report on, uh, uh, on Friday. Uh, we're gonna get a judgment from the judge. The first round we won, where they were found arbitrary and capricious because under the deference rule, they're so arrogant, they told the judge, we don't need to give you any reasons, just shut up and vote for us. The judge said no. I'll give you a chance to review, and now we're just finishing the second phase of that litigation. If the judge finds that uh, they have to, she has to give deference to the Federal Election Commission, you might as well write into the Constitution that for the rest of the history of this country, the only people who could become president are Democrats and Republicans. If we win, for reasons we don't have time for here, I can show you the, um, the, the pathway to an independent that will basically create a cascade of amazing independents who will run and give you the kind of choice you want in 2020. So that's debate access is one. The second one is ranked choice voting and the, and the, and the war that's going on in uh, Maine, which I want to just tell you about very quickly and then I'll stop. We went out and basically did a referendum in 2016 to have ranked choice voting for the first time in every vote in the state. In Maine, we basically won. We had the second most referendum votes in the history of Maine. We had more votes than Angus King had when he was senator, more votes than Governor LePage had when he ran for governor. And as soon as that happened, two people would never speak to them, speak to each other ever. The uh, Republican head of the Senate and the Democratic Attorney General got together. They went to the Supreme Court, got the Supreme Court to do something it admitted it never did to create a solemn occasion, and basically use it as cover to repeal the whole thing. So we're really now in a battle to basically get what's called a people's veto. So we're out on the street now to try to get uh, try to get ballots. But guess what? The Secretary of State, who doesn't like what we're doing, suddenly on November 1st, doubled the difficulty of um, of people to get the uh, get the ballots of requiring um, certificates that basically are infinitely more difficult than they were before. So these little things that you don't see that are going on that are going on in collusion between the two parties are what's killing our democracy. And until they're rooted out, and until people understand this is where the problem is, it's this little lever right here, get rid of that, and what you'll find is that gerrymandering will be a second order solution, campaign finance will basically, basically be in a better position because when you have three competitive, the amount of money you use is not, it's not as logical to use as much money as you use. And the whole idea of, well, gee, you know, the government is, the politicians are just, re you know, just, uh, reflecting a partisan country, you'll find that that's not true either because they'll be given the choice they really want. I'll stop there. Um, thank you. Um, so let me, pick, let me pick up on that and, and Jared, turn to you with a, a question that keeps occurring to me. Um, I understand your arguments, Peter, about the institutional barriers to a different kind of system, but I also wonder sometimes whether we are looking at a situation in which uh, the political system has balkanized the country or the country has balkanized the political system because voters have the right to, uh, uh, to, to act against uh, partisanship, polarization, and obstruction, but they often vote for exactly those things. And so what's the chicken and what's the egg here? Yeah, I think the answer is in, and I apologize, I'm a little under the weather for my voice. Um, 
I think the answer is in those statistics that Peter just gave, is that there are more de independents in this country than there are either Republicans or Democrats. Uh, and yet there's a monopoly on power by those, those two parties. The system isn't working when that's the case. So I think if, uh, you know, if, if they were leading it, then we wouldn't be quite as balkanized. There, there's an independent streak for a reason. And I think somewhere along the line, and Ellen uh, is a perfect example of someone who went into a, a tightly contested states, and she didn't change her principles in order to run. She just knew, and this is an element of leadership, how to talk about what she believes in a way that got independents and Republicans to say, yeah, I agree with that. That's what our system is supposed to be about. Somewhere along the lines, uh, the partisans decided that where the, the calculus used to be go after some amount of the a number of the independents to win, it's what I have to do is fire up my base, suppress the other base, and that is the key to victory. And that's really how we've been running most of our big but campaigns. But that only works if the independents stay home. Well, let's, let's look at this little book because that question has been answered by a guy named Mo Fiorita and what he basically said is, Democrats and Republicans are more internally homogeneous and more distinct from each other than parties of a generation ago, but there's no more evidence of polarization today than there was in the early 1980s. Even moderate voters will make polarized choices if that is all they're offered. And the problem is that the offering is too slim. And that's really where I think the problem has to be solved. And let me ask you this. You, you obviously are a, a veteran, a survivor, I guess, of the I'm system we're talking about here. Um, some of the things that uh, JR talks about doing to fix this, certainly sensible things, uh, ch you know, gerrymandering reform, uh, campaign finance reform, opening up primaries, uh, eliminating super PACs, in doing those things often would, re would require people in the system to change the system that brought them to power in the first place. In other words, they have a vet, the, the, the people who are in the system have a vested interest in the status quo because that's what got them there in the first place. How can you uh, turn to those people and ask them to make the kinds of reforms that this report talks about? Because we take an oath to the Constitution, not to the status quo. And if you actually understand what the, an oath is, it's a pledge, mm -hmm. it's your good name, it's your character. Uh, you're taking these promises before God, your country, your constituents, your family. Um, it, it, people have got to return to a sense that public service is a sacrifice. You're meant to move away from home. You're meant to be gone from your family. Your family and friends only see you when they know that you're actually standing in front of them. You're always meant to be there. You're always coming to the party. You're always hoping to be there. But frankly, you never know. And you know, this is meant to be a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice of income because for, for many, it, you make a whole lot more money than you do in Congress. It's a sacrifice of personal time. It's frankly a sacrifice of privacy and reputation, potentially. It's service. And that is the, that is the deal that you're making. And if that is true, then if you read the Constitution and you read the oath, the oath is to take that sacrifice and actually sublimate your own personal positions for the people that you represent. You're meant to be the representative of about 750,000 people. That, meant, that means you're meant to listen to them and, and you're meant to vote, in my opinion, you vote your conscience, the Constitution, and your constituents. And if you can keep those three C's, order? I think that they have to be in balance. Mm -hmm. And they have to be in balance. Look, you're, get, you, you're, you're sent by your friends and neighbors to represent them in Congress. You're meant to know more than they know but not better mm -hmm. than they know. And you know, even at home in California, you know, I see members of Congress voting completely against the interest of their constituents. And they're betting on the fact that their constituents won't know because they're too busy and they are either being uninformed or ill-informed, or that they're gonna have enough money to turn out their base and turn down, as John said, you know, this is about turning on and off. You turn on your base and you get them to be highly inflamed and show up at the polls, and you make everybody else either disgusted if you're an independent or demoralized if you're the other party. And probably you're already gonna win anyhow because you have a disadvantage, <laughs> you have an advantage because you're in a safe seat. Yeah. Um, I wanna ask about two other things quickly and then we'll open it up to your questions. Um, but I want to ask about parties. And if you look at the, uh, the, the audience response to the question, the basic question, what frustrates you about American politics, we seem to have party polarization as the top choice. Uh, perfectly understandable. 
Um, and, and I, I think that's probably uh, a fairly common sentiment. And in the report, you talk about the way parties have become drivers of polarization and of dysfunction, really. On the other hand, I hear a lot of people around this town say one of the problems has been the weakenings, yeah. uh, the weakening of the national parties. That the the, the weaker national parties allow extremists uh, and uh, and and ideologues who are in outliers of the system have uh, disproportionate influence. So, what's the answer here? More. More national party power or less national party power? Yeah. And I want you, and then Peter, I want you to ask, answer the same question. Well, first of all, a great question. I, and I have read a lot of that myself um, in terms of that's the wet reason that parties can't get a governing coalition. Right. You can't even get a caucus degree on something, much less the other side of the aisle. And I think there are some very tangible reasons for that. Uh, the carrots and the sticks that leaders and committee chairmen used to have really aren't available to them, whether it's earmarks. And I'm not, this isn't. Uh, Trevor, my friend Trevor Potter is back there, knows that I wouldn't be advocating for uh, reinstating earmarks um, or money. The fact that the party was the one who gave you your money, so you have to vote with the leader or you don't get the money, or, or chairmanships. All that, all that has gone uh, by the wayside. So, so there are no real carrots anymore. Um, in terms of what's the answer of how do you, I, I think the, the parties would be probably stronger if you uh, curtailed or got rid of super PACs because that's where all the money is flowing, that's where the power flows, and if, if that were restored to the parties, I think you'd see some of those disciplines. And that would be a better situation. I think that's a better yeah. situation. Well, first, if, if they were all like Ellen, they, you know, I, I think some people would say we wouldn't have a problem. My, my, my assumption is they all are like Ellen because everyone I've run into are fabulous, really great people. The problem is that they're thrust into a system that forces them to do things they'd really rather not do. So this is a classic duopoly problem. You have two people, you have two groups. They're the only ones who are there to compete. And until, in my opinion, you create a competitive form of a source of supply, which is by creating competitive independent candidates, and you need to do that in two ways, is to create debate access rules that allow people to get to the end of the game so they can start in the beginning, and at the local level to basically deal with ranked choice voting so they overcome the biggest obstacle, which is being a spoiler because you get rid of that problem completely with ranked choice voting. If you do those two things, you'll find the two parties will basically have to shut down towards the middle, and they'll be far more, I think, um, useful and friendly to the American people. Um, the, by the way, would a Congress that had two parties and a bunch of independents be any easier to run than the one we have now? Yes. Okay. Uh, so my other question, Ellen, I'll direct to you, has I to do with money. Why, but I mean, no, I'll let you do that for a second. Okay, great. Money. So you've identified money, I think, in the report as a the need for campaign money and the sources of campaign money as drivers of uh, polarization. Um, my question to you is whether what we saw in 2016 in the form of the Trump campaign, but even more in the Bernie Sanders campaign, which was financed largely in a way that I think most of us thought was not really possible, which is a viable national campaign fueled by lots and lots of small donations. Did, does that show it's possible to break out of the money uh, trap that most politicians think they're caught in? Yes, I think it does. Um, but you know, at the same time, you know, I was in the House with Bernie. Um, Bernie's not a Democrat. Yeah. Uh, you know, you could ask, you know, what medication we weren't taking <laughs> to allow somebody who wasn't a member of our party into us into our system. Um, get the credibility of running in our primary, get the exposure of running in our proper primary, get the platform of running in our party, only to have him trash us. Wait 44 days to endorse our nominee and then trash us for the next month and a half. And now trash us again. Uh, so, you know, I, I think the people that, you know, say that that, that, that was rigged, um, you know, what was rigged was we were too generous with somebody that really didn't do it. But I think his, the phenomenon of the campaign is that people will step away from the normal ways of doing things if they can. And there are a lot of people that want to give uh, small amounts, give whatever they can. I think that we have to encourage that. But right now, uh, because of unregulated dark money, uh, you know, it's like walking in your house after weeks of vacation and hearing water running. Immediately your heart seizes. <laughs> There's money in politics. The problem is, it's behind the wall right now. 
you can hear the water running, you know it's doing damage, you just can't find it. <laughs> and you can't turn the spigot off when you think to yourself, well, maybe, maybe it's you know, basically flooding the basement. You can't find the spigot to turn it off. So, so does the, to go back to your independence in Congress, if you get your dream and you have more of them, does the Bernie Sanders model suggest that's not going to be so easy as an operating model either? Well, I think Bernie Sanders and how he got the nomination is different from the point that we wanted to talk about now. So can I just address that yeah, for absolutely. a second? Absolutely. One of the interesting things is that Chuck Todd asked Bernie Sanders, I think around January, and said, Bernie, why does this independent socialist running on the Democratic ticket? And he said, because, Chuck, you wouldn't be talking to me otherwise. Okay. In January of 2000, Don Trump said, I could run as president on the reform ticket, but these new debate access rules basically makes it impossible for me to get into the debate, so why bother? So yeah. that's why he went where he went. But to get back to, so let's imagine a Senate that the score was 47, 47, 6. How would everybody behave? Well, right now, what we have now is it's either my way, nothing done, mm -hmm. or compromise. And compromise basically is the kiss of death in the primary season, as you've noted. So what we have to do is we have to reverse those priorities. So let's say we had six that basically said, um, okay, we are, we're six. And then what the two parties are going to do is they're going to go to these six and try to pick them off to basically caucus with them. So let's say we're talking about the Senate. So what they should do is basically come together and say, let's have a lunch. And they call in Chuck and say, Chuck, come on in for the main course and we have great news for you. On Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, you're going to be the head of the Senate. Thanks for coming. Ask Mitch to come in after you. Thanks for coming, Mitch, for dessert. On Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, you're going to be the head of the Senate. Now let's talk about all these rules that you've created that are basically on a two-party model. What, what I'm trying to say is that at the end of the day, this six can basically force an arbitration between the two as in a way that they could not do between each other. And that's, that's the point. Can I just add one thing? Mm -hmm. it, the dirty little secret is no matter how you get to Congress and everybody gets there the same way, you have to be elected by your constituents in your district. Uh, same thing for the Senate, your people in your state. What people don't understand is when you get there, no matter how independent you think you might be, whether you had DCCC support or DSCC support or who, who nominated you or who supported you. You cannot get an office and you cannot get on a committee unless you affiliate with one of the two parties. So, you're right, Peter. It'd be nice to think that there was this center fulcrum that was effectively kind of deciding what they were going to do. But the party rules, the caucus rules, the House and Senate rules right now make it impossible for anyone to, regardless of whether they call themselves a chimpanzee, a zebra, or an independent, they have to affiliate with one of the parties in order to actually get a committee assignment in an office. So, I mean, when Americans find this out, their hair goes on fire, yeah. as it should. Jerry, let me let's say one yeah. more thing about the money, um, is in terms of super PACs, I mean, the two uh, ethics of this is limits and transparency. Right. How much should people get limited yeah. and, and who's giving and for what purpose? The, that is a basic entitlement for the public to know. But it goes well beyond that, and I address this in the report, that the amount of time that is taken yeah. fundraising, and the fact the amount of business time, by some calculus, one third of time spent going to fundraisers in the middle you know, of session. So we shouldn't be doing fundraising during yeah. session. Um, lobbyists shouldn't be uh, bundlers for uh, campaigns. So there's all these things that take place on a daily basis that, you know, it, it's the reason I say that people say we, we uh, had to pass it before we knew what was in the bill. <laughs> but when you're out at fundraisers, instead of reading legislation and understanding what it is and working with your colleagues, that's, that's not hard to understand. Just, just as a footnote, um, I, it, in my checkered career, it happens I covered both the John Anderson campaign when I was 12 <laughs> and, um, and the Ross Perot movement. And there were, those were two moments when it seemed that what you guys are talking about was possible. It didn't quite happen, but it did seem possible. Uh, let, me, let me ask you all to, to uh, chime in with, with questions. If you just raise your hand, I'll find you. Uh, and there's a microphone coming around. Please tell us who you are um, and before you ask your question. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Bennett Minton. My, my question is, who is an independent? Because in canvassing door to door, I find people are either Democratic, Republican, or they don't know what the hell I'm talking about. It depends on what state you're in. Um, in California, we have what's called declined a state. Uh, I don't know about all the other states, but 
The choices have always been Democrat or Republican or something else. Sometimes it's independent. In New York City, for example, they've got 10 other parties. Uh, if you notice, when somebody runs for mayor, uh, there are some very old-fashioned, obscure parties that people can affiliate with. But um, the movement of declined to state or um, not affiliated um, is, I think, nationwide. But people, when they register to vote, a lot of people sit with their registration for party because it doesn't matter to them, but they don't understand what it means to the kind of mail they get, the kind of outreach they get, and the kind of um, opportunity that they have to get both sides of the story, uh, even through canvassing. I mean, if, you, if you've done some canvassing, you know you get it. You get a Democratic list and a Republican list, and you basically know who you're talking to. You don't get an independent list in most cases. Well, in Virginia, we don't have party registration. Right. But they still know. By the way, is the California primary system an answer to the gerrymandering problem? No. You said Peter says no? It's better. Uh, we, had, we had about seven uh, seats that were contested. By it the was, way, I'm talking about an open primary. We have what's called a guerrilla primary in California, so it's actually everybody's in the primary. Um, and then the two top vote getters, regardless of party, advanced to the general. Um, I think it improved some circumstances. Uh, in, in California, we had actually Republican on, on Republican in most cases. We had one or two where Democrat and Republican came out of the primary. Um, but you know, I think that it's better. Um, you know, but I think that we need an independent commission for Jerry, for, for redistricting um, mm -hmm. of people that really have no pol political affiliation. Um, but you say, you say Peter, no. Yeah, uh, the reason the reason not. And I was with Larry Diamond this morning, who's the Stanford professor, who's looks at these issues. The reason is, is because the designation of the top two happens in June and, and then basically it gives a tremendous advantage to party candidates who have natural name recognition versus independents. So if you look at it through the lens, which I try to do, of how is the, how is the independent, are they more empowered to be competitive or not, this is a... Doesn't do that. Doesn't do that. Yeah. Jerry, are you any thoughts on that no. before we go? Other questions? Uh, right there. Hi, my name is Kim Weichel. I have a question for Ellen. I want to follow up on your excellent point that serving in the Congress is service. It is an honor. Uh, the two criteria for decision making should be what's best for my constituents, what's best for my country. But the three criteria that seem to be used is what's best to get me elected, how do I get money, and what's best for my party to get back at the other party that don't relate to the two criteria you mentioned. So I guess my question is, you know, how do we change that trend? Can the major majority leader, set a trend, remind people why they're serving? I mean, we've gotten so far away from, from the very ideals that people say they're serving for. No, uh, you know, when I was in the Congress from 96 to 2009, um, during the time that the Republicans were in the majority in the House, they actually had a thing called the Hastert Rule, oh, yeah. which, ha which had to be changed, obviously, because of Mr. Hastert. But the Hastert rule effectively was um, a pox on all of our houses. It effectively said that the majority of the majority had to pass something. Nothing could come to the floor for a vote unless the Republicans could pass it without any Democratic votes. That's the kind of um, mentality, yeah. ridiculous <laughs> hyperpartisanship. Yeah. That, grasping that for prevents grasping everybody. Grasping for adjectives here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the truth is that, you know, Paul Ryan doesn't have the Hastert rule because the Hastert rule now, nobody can speak that name. But there's a form of it um, in everything that they're doing, and so does Mitch McConnell. So, you know, there's no effort. Everything's done behind closed doors, no effort to have any kind of bipartisanship. Um, you saw the pictures of the nine or 12 men that were writing the health care bill without any women. I mean, the things are ridiculous. But Yes, it is supposed to be about service. Um, if, you, if we went to public financing, um, there, you still have to deal with, and Peter's had some good thoughts on this, and John does too, you have to deal with the, the overpowerful weight of incumbency. Um, the, the fact that you are somewhat of a household name, you are someone that you know, can go on TV anytime, get, you know, get an audience of people, be written up in the newspaper. And so for an unknown to challenge that is enormously difficult. So we have to do some things. If we went to public financing, everybody had their $50 to run. You still have to find a way to have incumbency not become such a barrier to entry. 
Yeah. And, and partly it's, it's perpetual campaign mode. You'll see right. in the report, and, and a lot of it goes for presidential, but Senate and House, it's, it is constant. And people say, well, we'll have to do that after the next election. The problem is, Lindsey Graham says, after every election, there's another election. Right. I, I served in the Senate as a staffer, and I, I remember towards the end of sessions and people walking around with who's up for election, who don't want to go back, so don't pass anything with their name on it. It doesn't right. matter if it's good, bad, or indifferent. So everything is seen through the lens of what is going to help me and mine get elected, not what's right, not what's helpful. I, as a staff director of the Commerce Committee, uh, I had a great relationship with the Democrat staff director. And we promised ourselves that we would do our best as staffers to judge things at the staff level on merit. And I remember the very first bill we had on the floor, one of the councils came over and said, well, here, here was an amendment that we need to oppose. And I, and I said, well, who, whose is it? Well, it's a Democrat, so we need to oppose it. And I said, well, what to do? So they explained what it does, and they said, well, what's wrong with that? Well, nothing, but it's, uh, it was offered by a Democrat. So no, no, then that's, but that is so permeated, the yeah. institution. Everything is seen through the lens of my party, we versus they. Uh, and it's, it's been that way for a long time, but as I say, the concern that I have expressed in this report is that it has been systematized right. for a lot of reasons, that unless we start to unravel it, it's yeah. going to get worse. Peter, you were going to ask that? I, I think, I, I'll be very quick, and I, and I don't want to I think you have to distinguish. There's, there's money and there's money in politics. So, for example, to me, Bernie Sanders basically accumulated a fund from all his elections for dog catcher and above before president, and the excess basically he used as venture capital for his campaign mm -hmm. for president. Nobody who gave him that money for dog catcher necessarily wanted him to be president. So then he goes out and yells and screams about campaign finance. So, early money is a good thing because it's like venture capital money. The later money where you're in six states and pounding the states with $2 billion worth of um, negative ads, that, that's what we really don't want to see. But, but just this overall money is bad in politics, I think is, uh, is, is, is not accurate. Yeah, I, I agree with that, yeah. Uh, question back there and then we'll go here next. Hi, Trevor Potter. A great report. I think it raises uh, all the important issues that we need to be talking about. Uh, I would briefly say as a former FEC chair that I agree with all the comments about how the two parties have essentially frozen everyone else out. Uh, the problem is they have now done that for about 200 years. They have the Supreme Court saying that's a good thing, that it provides stability. You therefore have state laws that magnify that and make it, as Peter well knows, make it very difficult for a new party to form. So my view has been that at the moment, until somehow the ice cracks, you're going to end up with these two parties. The question is, how do you make the system that they currently try to control any better? And there, I think it is all about the money. You know, as, as the report notes, and you have been discussing, the fundraising race is crazy. It means members have no time for anything else. Uh, I think you look at Sanders and Trump this year, and you actually have two candidates who were not really members of their party. That's right. Uh, that's the first thing. Secondly, right. they right. did right. raise uh, and have strong small donor support. I do not see that as a good thing. The idea of small donor support is good, but what we learned here is that the extremes get rewarded because mm -hmm. those are the people who get energized and give. We've seen that in the House where far left noisy Democrats and far right noisy Republicans do the best at small donor fundraising from all over the country, never mind their district, because they're representing those angry extremes. So I think the lesson for us is we have to find a way to cut the money chase and provide funding for yep. challengers and members. I agree you have to take incumbency into account, but you can do that in a way that will promote people coming out of the woodwork running for races in the center and, and moving it from currently an estimate of 40 seats in the House that are even potentially in play in a gerrymandered system to you know 140, right. which would make a huge difference. Yeah. And the only thing that can do that is some sort of citizen funding program. Yeah. That's right. Let me, um, if I may, just quickly and go to Peter. So first of all, one of the things, if it is a good report, it's because I quote Trevor several times in that <laughs> report. Um, but this, this whole issue of uh, the tone of campaigns and the fact who, how do you reach out to quote your base. 
uh, and the things that people say and the things that people believe when they ca cast their vote have little bearing on reality. And so we're playing out this, this kind of uh, fiction. And, and in the debate, uh, who, what American was proud of the debates that we had in the last presidential? It was an international embarrassment. And this is a perfect example, again, of how I think the parties have corrupted the system in that who said that the parties and the candidates and this commission should be the one to decide the number and the format and the topics uh, that are debated, as important as that is in our process? And who is to say that it needs to be a famous journalist who usually is just trying to score some points rather than dig into what these people know and what's their capacity of leadership? Why is not? the interview job to be the most important job in the country, a matter of law. There will be this many t uh, debates. They will be these on, on these topics. They will be uh, superintended by somebody who's a subject matter expert, who has journalistic skills. And guess what? There's lots of them. You don't need Cooper Anderson and, and all the others. Um, so the fact that we've tolerated this, after a while you kind of say, what, what's wrong here? Why have we tolerated? Anyway. Uh, Trevor, with due respect, I, I wish you'd look at our lawsuit. Let me just give you a, a real world example. When we created Americans Elect, we went to the Federal Election Commission and said, great news, we're going to have a third, a third alternative. It'll be um, nonpartisan. The, the, the selection process will be uh, objective. And they said, no, 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 you're not objective. You're obviously biased. And because you're biased, you're a party. And because you're a party, we're going to regulate you. And by the way, we don't regulate you the way we do the two major parties. So we're going to go out and basically say, even though you need 38 million bucks, you can only raise it in $5,000 increments. And uh, so I gave it a try. So I go to California, and I visit with a bunch of your friends. I have three meetings, an hour and a half meeting each. My tongue would be hanging below my chin. One would say, yes, I collect five grand. I have $1,500 of expenses, and I discovered to create 20,000 meetings to raise that money. So I sued. We sued the Federal Election Commission. And guess what? We won. We had to go to the Court of Appeals, and you could just read it. We won. The Court of Appeals basically said, as long as you have an objective pro process, you can raise money any way you want. I was a large part of that money, but so were many other people. Now, we basically are sitting here with the Federal Election Commission that is supposed to overlook the Commission on Presidential Debates. That's supposed to be nonpartisan. Well, if I'm a Martian and I read Merriam-Webster, nonpartisan means, when Leon Panetta raises his hand and says, I'm for Hillary Clinton, and he's on the directorship, is that nonpartisan? When John Danforth says, I'm for Jeb Bush, is that nonpartisan? When basically Alan Simpson, one of the directors, writes, if you want a third in the debates, go to Sri Lanka, India, or Indonesia, is that nonpartisan? When nine others have given money to various presidential candidates, that's nonpartisan? Obviously not. We said to them, how can you have all these people here who are well over a majority of the commission doing partisan acts, and, they're, and you're supposed to be nonpartisan? The answer was, well, just because these people are acting in a partisan manner, that doesn't mean the commission's nonpartisan. This is what you're dealing with. And so we won the first round of the lawsuit. The lawsuit was argued finally on Friday. I, I wish you would look at it, because if we win, the world's not going to be the same. Because if we win, it's going to either force the Federal Election Commission into a rulemaking that will allow for independence, or will be able to, and that me, to me that's more important, is to basically sue the commission on presidential debates until they allow their composition to reflect what the American people are, which is a predominant of unaffiliated people. When you do that, the whole way we elect our president is going to change. So, so who would you have draw the line for uh, admission into a presidential debate, and how would you draw it yourself? Okay. Great question. Thank you for asking. So right now, what you have to, what you do is you basically have five polls that the Commission on Presidential Debates admits is inaccurate. In fact, we know that it's an 8% inaccuracy rate. So the, um, the answer is we need to move from that polling taken with six weeks to go to a competition open to everyone that would yield one winner, because you can't have more than three in the debates, that will be resolved in April. So let me give you an example of what that might look like. Right now, to get into the, um, into the debates, you have to be uh, you know, qualified. You have to be an American above the age of 35. You have to be on the ballot in states that exceed 270 electoral college votes, and that, the only way to do that is to get signatures in the street. So let's say you had a rule and said anybody who can get signatures equal to 4% of those who voted in, uh, in uh, 2016 will be eligible, and if more than one did it, whoever has the most signatures worldwide will be definitely be known by April the third in the debates. That person 
will have no problem, in my opinion, getting 50 bucks from 4 million people if they're unaffiliated. They'll be in the debates, and the whole name recognition problem will go away because they're in an iconic position. The other way to do that is what we call the America's Independent Primary, where eight people will get together, will be introduced, and in, let's say at the end of uh, 2019 to the American people, they'll be polled, they'll be discussed, they'll be polled, and basically um, uh, starting in January, there'll be a set of um, debates, and the debates will go on for two or three months, there'll be more polling, and at the end we'll have this internet-based convention. One round will drop out four of the eight, then, then uh, one round will drop out the, the uh, bottom two, and then the bottom one will have a winner. If that winner gets more than, let's say, has an expression of interest, of support, more than 4% of where the American people were in the last election, they'll be in the debates. But what the two parties have done, and they know they've done it, and they've looked at me and laughed about it, is to say, yeah, what we're going to do is we're going to basically make it as uncertain for as long as possible as to whether you're going to be in the debate. So we basically do shut off what you would normally do, is basically give people early earned media mm -hmm. because they're considered to be viable. So what they have done, and they know they're doing it's it. It's rope-a-dope. They, they, they've created a catch-22 to make sure that no one will be viable except a Democrat or Republican. Read our documents. We, um, we got Ipsos and Doug Schoen. We had the very best people, basically, to build that argument. It's, it's there for you to see. But they're obscure rules, and people just don't want to look at that. Uh, we have a question here. Uh, thank you for this great discussion. I'm Faye Mokhtadur. I'm an Atlantic Council member. Uh, this uh, question is for uh, Mrs. Tauscher. Uh, why do you think we have such a uh, bipolar, I mean, uh, polarization in our Congress? It seems to me that it's because our country is completely divided. And I'm saying that's because when I was campaigning for President Obama, uh, not too far, far away from here, nation's capital, Spotsylvania County, uh, I had to canvas certain neighborhood and people came out, I am not kidding, with guns and their dogs after us. It was no longer uh, the fact that they didn't like this man to be elected. Uh, and at the end, I told my partner that as much as I like to campaign for President Obama, I don't really want to get killed over it. So uh, we ended up not knocking at so many doors. So we have a polarized country. And I think, uh, don't you think that's the reason we have a polarized Congress? Thank you. You know, I think th this is, uh, thank you for that great question. Uh, and thank you for trying to influence your fellow citizens. <laughs> I think that it is a chicken and the egg. I, I align myself with what John has said. Uh, you know, my observation is, um, you know, back 30, 35 years ago, uh, somebody like Newt Gingrich decided he wanted to go to Congress. He was going to go and take the majority back for the Republicans. In order to do that, he decided that he was going to run against Washington, D.C., and people in Congress. And what we now have is a Congress with between a 9 and 11 percent approval rating. And in major institutions in this country uh, completely eviscerated with no real following and no, uh, a lot, most Americans feeling as if institutions have failed them. That was a 30-year campaign. It included other elements. It included things like um, partisanship, uh, tribalism, team sports. So there's a red and blue team. And I think that what happened is, I think the Congress became polarized in order to uh, have power for one party or the other. I think, you know, and believe me, my party has not been, you know, Pollyanna-ish about this. But I think that, that moved forward and we began this uh, slippery slope of people not believing in institutions, Congress being completely, you know, put down. But then factions created inside the Congress. Uh, we have people in the Congress right now that are not for this government. They're not for an organized government like we have it. They're not for their constituents, by and large. They get elected by a small band of people because the seats are created for one party to own them. And all you have to have, all you have to do is win your primary. And the way you win your primary is to be the most extreme because all you need is to have your base turn out. And that is really. That, that started first. If you look back at where the egg is, that's the egg. The rest of it is the feathered things that came out, and they're pretty ugly. Uh, but you know, the, the money put on top of that, all of these things started to happen. But it, it's about power. People are not confused what this is about. This is the biggest game in the world, and it's the biggest 
uh, power base in the world. And to have that power is what people really want. They figured out how to do it. Um, so I think that Americans, now you, you dial on, on top of that, uh, television media, ca cable television media, uh, networks that, that have become red and blue team cheerleaders. Uh, you know, I, my, my father died last year at 89. He was a yellow dog Democrat from Hudson County, New Jersey, where the dead voted Democratic. He only watched MSNBC. I used to say to him, Daddy, I need you to watch Fox for a couple, of, a couple of hours a day. Just tell me what they're talking about. Oh, no, I'm not going to do that. And he would call me, and he would say, so I did that. He says, we're not even in the same sphere. Of, we're not talking about the same things. And I'd say, of course. That's the point. And so you, what people do is self-enforcing of their own opinions. So you watch, you, you follow the people that are saying the things that you kind of believe. They amplify them. They give voice to things that are probably a little bit more than you might want to say. But, you know, okay, it's entertainment too. I think that the egg definitely started in the, in, in the way the political systems tried to aggregate power and maintain power. Yeah, and I think, I think a dirty secret is that the parties agree on so much more than people know. Right. And you take that sliver or they don't, and when you're running at something, I need you to inspire you to vote for me against Ellen. I'm going to take that 5% and I'm going to put it on steroids and make it really good. It's evil, or good versus evil. I think, and it's again in the report, uh, during the Clinton and Dole election, I think the big difference in their tax plan was a few percentage right. points mm -hmm. on the, on the tap, ta top tax rate. That was the difference between a bleeding heart communist and a, right. you know, this hardened criminal on the other side. I just, it, it makes no sense. By the way, you, you accomplished the near impossible by turning a house uh, seat in California from one part or the other. I don't think, I've looked at the numbers. In the last three decades, that was almost impossible to do. So I mean, you're living proof that it can be done, but you're one of the very few people who's proven it can be done at all. So um, f uh, we're almost out of time. I wanted to close, and there's, we have one more slide uh, that poses the question, I think, to pull this back to the Atlantic Council's mission here. What should America's role in the world be? And Jerry, I wanted to bring it back to that question, just ask you, how does this problem or the problems we've been talking about here actually affect that because what people want the America's America's role in the world to be above all is to lead and support our allies and partners right how is that undermined by what we're talking about uh, I think it's gravely undermined we've spent the entire post-world war era getting the world to understand the value of freedom free markets free enterprise be like us your life will be better and guess what they have and they have rallied to that in 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 large way and now we're at a position this way saying we're now spoiling the American idea when mm -hmm. people are broad look and say, I don't think I want that. I'm going to look for something else. Mm -hmm. And as, as countries in the developing world that are going to determine the uh, level of global order and stability, when you look at the population growth in Africa, mm -hmm. it's going to dominate this century. And if they decide that they want to hell truck with the Chinese and the Russian model versus the United States model, that is a bad outcome for this country, and it's a bad outcome for mankind. Um, thank you for the report. Um, thank you. Peter, Ellen, thank you for joining My us. And thank you all for being here. This is uh, all of us who live this problem in whatever perspective we see it, know how real it is, and, and I think you've made a valuable contribution. Thanks. So thank you. Thank Good you. job. Thank you know, my, um, my son was in Lee at five.